having a little snuffle. Um, did you order to do the clapping? Turns out it was quite, it was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> I think that might be one of the most beautiful things. Like, I've had wine, obviously. Right? Thanks, Richard. Honestly, I mean, I cry at pretty much anything on a regular basis. So it doesn't take something as beautiful as that to make me cry. But oh, that really got me because I was having my usual like, oh, make this all about me moment of going, what if no one else claps? What if I'm the only person on the street with Twitter that knows this is happening? And then playing um, a group D&D &D game in there because I'm cool in so many ways. And, uh, and we were like, oh, right, we should go and start clapping. And then you started to hear it as you got close to the window. And then just there was somebody banging pots. There was somebody letting off fireworks, like just over towards the downs. And there was, um, as the buses went past our flat where we live, all these, um, all the horns going off and the scooter joining in and just one guy walking up the street who I don't know if he was anticipating this happening at this point, but just clapping as he walked along. Oh my goodness, I think, I don't know, maybe this is just a weird time, but that felt like one of the most amazing human experiences. I don't think I'll go through something, well, I don't know, you never know what's around the corner to you, but wow, that was amazing. Um, I hope they know. I hope enough people got videos so that everybody that's elbows deep in, in gloves and aprons at the moment like gets to see that because there was so much genuine love like if every single person that was out clapping tonight votes in a way that actually protects those people's jobs and lives in the future then then maybe we're going to be all right you know oh i feel every emotion all of them they're all coming out of my throat oh how are you guys are you all right are you good days i've um i've had a karma day today Oh, I spent my morning recording a, a scene. My friend Suze is a big fan of, um, I have to take my jumper off, I'm really warm, sorry. What am I wearing underneath? Yeah, that's all right. Um, <laughs> um, my friend Suze is a big uh, EastEnders fan and uh, she's recreating EastEnders because um, they've cut it down to three episodes a day rather than the 50 that I assume it was. Oh, a brighter light's made this look much worse, hasn't it? Um, and uh, so I was filming a scene from that this morning and then I've been trying to pace myself a bit more. I think I maybe started this whole lockdown thing with a bit of frantic energy and now I'm trying to make that manageable. But um, I'm loving doing this and I think there will be a new news drip tomorrow. Um, I'm also, I've been directing some people and helping some people out with comedy because like, I'm I'm a stand-up comedian normally when we're allowed out of the house and uh and I've been going about 10 years and it's sort of all right really I'm sort of starting to get there so I've now started like coaching other people with material so um I've said that while we're all on lockdown I'll do it for free for people so that people that are like lower down don't have to worry about not being creative during this time because they're worried about the money so I think tomorrow I'm gonna like bury myself in other people's material which is really exciting for me because there's no pressure on me to come up with the ideas I just get to mold them and find the best and like milk all the ideas out of them so oh anyway I hope you're all all right my lovely team I'm gonna I'm gonna have to really think of what we're gonna do after this book because I'm not giving this up this is too nice um now, um, we're, we're only going to do one chapter tonight because I've sort of skim read it and it's long um, and um, it feels like an event, this chapter. So we'll do this one big chapter and then um, we'll go back to the two or three usually. I, I don't want you to think I'm now skimming it down to one chapter a night. No, but um, it is a long chapter. Uh, so we'll do one big one. Um, so I might pop back and see what's happening in the chat like midway through but I can't see the chat while I'm talking and I don't like seeing the number of people in the room either because then if somebody has to pop out to do something or come back then I go oh why did they leave after that line and then I can't concentrate on the writing but that's because I'm an insecure bitch not because you shouldn't go and get on with your lives if you need to um anyway oh uh I'm overexcited aren't I uh chapter 24 the atmosphere in the village hall was a muted mania. Every decade of the 20th century was represented in the fashion show that was Norton Fitzwarren's best clothes. Smocks sat alongside double denim ensembles, which were nestled behind chinos, which accompanied sequined minis, which in turn caught the attention of cords and dungarees alike.
Mr. Young's tie-dye affair was a sight to be beheld, and if anyone had worked out why Nigel from the village shop was wearing a corked hat, they didn't let on. A long table had been set up at one end of the rectangular space. Behind it sat the vicar, Jesus, Hamish and Sarah. Thankfully, they at least seemed to have had some kind of a hold on dressing pro appropriately. In the rest of the village hall sat the population of Norton Fitzwarren. The lucky early ones had seats. They packed themselves into neat rows with children crammed on laps and anything and everything being used as a fan to soothe roasting skin. People were crammed in all around the chairs, crouching or standing and craning their necks for a view of the tabletop. The mass of people seemed like an impressive beast, shifting and wobbling, groans emitting for centuries, though it was some rural monster preparing to die suggest the unwitting newcomer, a very real communion. The walls of the old hall creaked with the heat and the strain of expectation. This hall had stood proud and then incrementally less and less proud as the years wore on since 1957. It probably should have been locked down not long after Macmillan departed, but somehow it clung on, held together through the decades by rats' nests and each new generation's pubescent desire for slow dances. Today's meeting eclipsed even the biggest historical events that Norton Fitzwarren had ever seen. If you were a simple onlooker, you would be hard pushed to tell who was more nervous behind the table at the top of the hall. The vicar was swinging wildly between uncontrollable excitement and scathing scepticism. Hamish was singing Credence Clearwater Revival under his breath and wondering why on earth he was behind the table in the first place. Sarah was counting all the biscuits that had been lavished upon the event and Jesus, well Jesus was just looking nervous, cartoon character nervous, sweat jumping off his eyebrows nervous. What he was struggling to work out was whether they would prefer a collection of greatest hits or, excuse me, sorry, burping mid-story, what a dirty gurty, um, uh, was whether they would prefer a collection of greatest hits or if they'd desire something new and vibrant. There were jugs of water on the table before him, but no wine glasses. Was that a clue? He'd also been furnished with custard creams, suggesting that food, perhaps, was also taken care of. Having sneaked a biscuit while no one was looking, he was fairly confident these were not appetisers to precede a fish dish. The vicar looked around his comrades behind the table and nodded to each one. He stood up and coughed to get the crowd's attention. <clears throat> he failed spectacularly in this first mission and resorted to shouting, Hello! Hello, everybody! whilst waving his hands above his head as if signalling a plane down. The front row all obediently stared back at him. The rest of the room continued to fail to notice his desperate efforts. Jesus got to his feet to give the vicar a hand. Sensing movement from their honoured guest, the entire room fell to silence, as if playing the Olympic gold medal, medal? <laughs> Blah. Olympic gold medal game of musical statues. They sat frozen, anticipating his next move with bated breath. He simply sat back down and nodded to the vicar. <clears throat> Sighting, isn't it? The wine. Oh yeah, well, I don't normally drink white wine because white wine turns me into a terrible, terrible human being. <laughs> but um, lovely husband Tom came home with it and it's a, it's a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I think, because I'm proper fancy. Um, I'm finding gins getting me down. They always say gins are depressant and when I'm out, I don't think that, but having a gin and tonic every other night while we've been doing this, I've, ooh, I have noticed I've been a bit more miserable. Cheers, Faye. Hello, lovely Faye. If you don't follow Faye on Twitter, you should follow Faye on Twitter. She's the most endlessly supportive, lovely human being. I mean, everybody is that's amongst this, but Faye I've known since before we started doing the book, and she's a delight. The vicar looked around his comrades behind the table and nodded to each one. He stood up and coughed to get the crowd's attention. Oh, we've already read that. Oh, see, this is why I don't normally drink wine when we're doing this. <laughs> right, so Jesus, he simply sat back down and nodded to the vicar. The vicar shuffled uncomfortably and nodded his thanks. Bloody show off, he thought. Get your own flock. Hello, everybody, he uttered out loud. 
Hello, and thank you so much for coming to this most prestigious meeting of the Apocalypse Committee. As you can see from our head table up here, we have made some exciting developments in the last few days, and it's it's time to come together as a group to discuss where we go from here. Uh, before we begin, shall we bow our heads in prayer? Who to? came a voice from the middle of the pack. The heads of the top table whipped up sharply. The tension in the air was strung, was strung out on a razor's edge. Uh... I'm sorry, floundered the vicar. Who are we praying to, if you don't mind me asking? It was the voice of Martin Young, tempestuous upstart from the semi-detached houses to the north of the village. For reference, watch this country. I, I mean, I wrote this book long before I'd ever seen this country, but I have never seen a more perfect depiction of life in the West Country than this country. At 24 years of age, he was a born and bred Norton Fitzwarrener who had elected to stay on in the village instead of going further afield to seek a life. The furthest Martin Young had travelled in his quarter of a decade was the suburbs of Bristol. And he'd only done that because he thought he was in love. It turned out he wasn't in love. He just liked seeing breasts that weren't on a screen. Don't we all? It had soon been made apparent to Martin Young that these could be found without having to pay the £21 return coach fare to this particular suburb of Bristol. And the fair maiden had been cut adrift. We're, we're praying to the Lord our God, of course. The vicar's voice cracked a little mid-sentence. He could sense trouble. Why couldn't they just behave this once? It was like having your star pupil wet themselves mid-story time during Ofsted. Can't we just speak to him directly, seeing as how that's meant to be him and all that? There was a matter-of-factness to Martin's speech that made it hard to laugh at. The congregation looked from Martin to the vicar to Jesus and then amongst themselves as they tried to process the issue. Well, uh, we will be praying to God, Martin. Th this, well, this is Jesus, his, his manifestation on earth, his son, Jesus. I thought they was all one and the same in that. So if he's here, no offence, Jesus, mate. I'm not having a go or nothing. Just seems sort of pointless to be praying to him. He's there, isn't he? The vicar's mouth hovered somewhere between open and firmly clamped shut. I'd say it was firmly clamped open. He'd always started everything with a prayer. Since he'd found his faith quietly and unexpectedly, he'd began things with a prayer. It didn't matter if it was a small one to himself or himself or an all-inclusive group affair for anyone who wanted to join in. Well, how shall we begin if we don't have a prayer? He heard his voice asking. It sounded thin and weak. The room was silent. Jesus got to his feet again. Perhaps I, uh, I could do a blessing he offered. The vicar nodded numbly and hastened back to his seat. He felt small, ridiculous, usurped and useless. He stared at his shoes and couldn't bring himself to put his hands together. Hamish placed a, Hamish placed, Hamish placed a hand on his shoulder. Hamish placed a hand on his shoulder. That's a difficult sentence. Right. I need to learn how to write to be read out loud, don't I? Hamish placed a hand on his shoulder. The vicar grasped it firmly and appreciatively. Ladies and gentlemen, began Jesus, thank you for joining us today. Blessed be those who walk in the light of the Lord. Long may his love shine upon us all. I bloody hope not, said Mr Baxter. Steady on, came Nigel from the village shop's reply. You can't say that to Jesus, not during a blessing. I bloody can, carrying on like he doesn't know it's the end of the world. Long may his light shine on us, my tush. We're finished with all that, aren't we? Let's just start dividing up who's going where and be done with it. It's too late for all these blessings and things now. It's dividing time. It's called judgment day, not dividing time, said Mr Frinton irritably. And there's nothing to say all the final decisions or, or judgments have been made anyway. So you might want to think about behaving yourself, sir. Bloody fine religion it'd be if you lived a crackin' old life like I have, behaving every bloody rule, and then you get sent to hell anyway just for speaking out of turn before the minutes were even being taken. Am I supposed to be taking minutes? shrieked Karen Ford, who usually took the minutes at village meetings. Her husband worked in the city, no one was entirely sure which one, and it left Karen with sufficient unemployed hours to keep accurate minutes with a fine level of detail. Oh, I'm not going to hell for that. That's not fair. No one told me I was supposed to be taking them. My chair wasn't set out or anything. 
Hey, no, no one's going to hell, began Jesus before uproar from the village forced him back into perturbed silence. What, no one, yelled Mr Baxter, not even this upstart. He waved Rufus's lead in the direction of Martin Young. He's never attended church in his life and I've got a positive word to say about anybody. I'm not having that, no way, not after all the effort I've gone to leading a good Christian life. No one said Beryl faintly. Oh, thank heavens for that. Literally, literally, let's all thank heaven for that. What a relief. So when are we off? asked Mrs. White in a practical tone. Is there a coach? Will there be a beam of light, Jesus? Jesus was staring at the melee, wondering what fresh ruckus his next words would kick off. He felt like the end bearing in a Newton's cradle. I'm just checking your comments. Oh, yeah, mainly wine. <laughs> How was the story? Don't know. I didn't listen. Was pissed. Um, oh no! Don't open keynote, you idiot. Put that back on the bar. Sorry. Small admin tabar tabarkle debacle. That's it. I put tomorrow. I won't have a glass of wine, and you'll actually get a story. Uh, no, no. Hang on a minute. We're not all going to heaven. The room paused. Purgatory, muttered Mr Baxter. Everyone shuddered, like a New Year's Day when your aunt bought milk in time and you've seen Ben-Hur too recently to enjoy it. All eyes were on Jesus as he rubbed his fingers across the palm of his other hand and tried to sense the needs of the room. What did they want from him? What could he say to calm them down? He took a deep breath and slowly surveyed the room, taking in each expectant face. Now that you mention it, I can see how you would believe that this was indeed Judgment Day. However, I'm afraid that on this occasion you have been slightly misinformed. The vicar bristled. Jesus continued, This is not quite the end of the world, or uh, should I say, it doesn't have to be. The purpose of this uh, hiatus of life as we know it, is to ascertain whether or not the continuation of the human race is uh, worth it. Um. Every pair of eyes in the village hall narrowed. They stared at Jesus. Jesus swallowed, very aware that his words sounded ever so slightly more tyrannical than he had intended. So let me get this straight, piped up Mr Baxter. You're going to observe us for a bit, and then if we pass your test, we can all go back to normal. Jesus hesitated. Mr Baxter carried on, slowly, as if unravelling a logic puzzle by a series of simple solutions. Because I tell you, young man, I've lived through a few wars where people had ideas like that, you know, live to this set of rules I've made up in me head or you're all going to die. And let me tell you, none of them dictators was ever that popular or right for that matter. So perhaps you need to explain to us just a little bit more what you mean and why you got the right to be that way. Well, uh, I created you, Jesus began, trying not to smile at his new role as young man. Mother gives birth to a child. It don't give her the right to pop him off on his fifth birthday when the little type learns to talk back. Mr Baxter seemed oddly alive given the apocalyptic circumstances. People stared at him, unsure whether he was talking them all into an early grave or rescuing them from certain slavery. Jesus was stunned. His second attempt at being on earth was making it abundantly clear to him that absence did indeed make the heart grow fonder. Proximity to humans made them cross with him. He'd never felt so awkward or at such a loss for words. They hadn't meant to start this way. They were supposed to be sitting quietly and listening while he spoke, not shouting at him already. Of course what he had to say sounded bad. They hadn't let him say it right. They'd made him start in the middle. He looked to the other people arranged behind the top table, hoping for some backup. They all simply stared back. The vicar looked oddly pleased. Jesus made a mental note to take the man aside for a quick chat at some point, check he was all right. Hey, uh, let me start again, Jesus tried, but the crowd's blood was up and they were somewhere between terrified stampede and baying mob. What? 
You mean wipe us all out and start again? Beryl from the village shop sounded close to tears. No, no, I mean just start again with a meeting here today, blustered Jesus. I'm sorry, I appear to have begun this badly and I'm not really explaining myself very well. I do apologize. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll try and explain my reasons for being here much more clearly and uh, hopefully it'll give you some peace of mind. Yeah? The audience waited. Mr. Baxter said nothing. Jesus nodded and was just about to continue when Mr. Young piped up. Excuse me? Yes, came Jesus. Uh, yeah? Came Jesus' voice, timid and a little tired sounding. Well, just before you get going, you got any proof that you actually are, Jesus? You got ID or something? Jesus did not have ID. Thankfully, what he did have was indescribable gravitas, like George Clooney, but better. He smiled and gave a friendly wave of his left hand at Mr. Young. Do you believe I am Jesus Christ? He asked him in a hazy, low voice made of brown colours and autumnal memories. Mr. Young's mouth opened to respond. It opened slowly to give his brain time to read his own thoughts. What it came back with surprised him. Yes. Yes, I believe you are, Jesus Christ. And he did. Everyone in the room did. Everyone in the room was sure. Jesus nodded calmly at the lake of faces before him. I understand. Hey, I understand that you're nervous. Frightened, perhaps even angry. I would be too. The truth is, I didn't make the decision to pause the earth lightly. I've deliberated over this for decades, watching humans learning and changing and developing, choosing their own paths and then beginning the learning process all over again at the start of each new path. It has been a joy to behold, a spectacle more elaborate and beautiful than the rarest astronomical delight. I have trodden a unique, solitary path, somewhere between exhilaration, terror, and exhaustion. I have watched alone as my most precious creation, companion, and offspring makes their way so flamboyantly towards their future. So why stop you? Why set in? Why interfere and risk losing it all? Because I was afraid I was losing you. I've seen things that have shaken me, atrocities that have broken my heart more than I thought possible. But after these, I've seen people, you, build the world and my heart back up to twice its original capacity. You continually surprise me. But these breakages are growing more numerous and clumsier and more apathetic become your attempts to prevent and mend. I began to fear you're, you were losing your way. So strident are your moves on each new path that you take no care to learn anything that isn't of your own progression. And then I saw something here in this village, something that seemed like the core of my fears in a nutshell, something that tweaked every niggle in my worry about the frailty of your bodies and souls. I saw love falter, a love that makes more sense than seasons, a love more generous than nature, a love more comforting than carbohydrates. I saw it falter and I knew that if I couldn't fix this love and negate the complications that threatened to overwhelm it, then I, I'd lost you. There's nothing to be saved except a slow descent into heartache for the human race. Without loves like these existing, you will lose it. Lose the point of your technology and your mass production. It's all so that you can be with one another. Have more time with one another. Connect despite distances. Be still with one another. Worry less about mortality and enjoy one another. Without that love, you're nothing and you won't want anything. I chose you and your village because of who you are and what you represent. I don't believe you represent the earth, but you represent the best of what you could be. I ask you to be courteous enough to allow me to live time, it, it worked historically, for me to be here. <laughs> After that, we'll decide together the route we should take. And don't be worrying that I'm merely here to convert you. <laughs> I have bigger issues than adding to the flock at the moment. I'll leave that to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Where did I go so wrong with them, eh? <laughs> My motor self, sort that mess out next. <laughs> Jesus was quite aware he should have talk, stopped talking a few sentences ago, bowed out gracefully while the audience was still looking dumbstruck and in awe of him. 
His mouth, however, wouldn't stop. He was rusty, he could feel it. Only now his brain was kicking back in, reminding him where he was. The adrenaline of the speech wearing off slowly. He stopped speaking and looked back to the vicar. Jesus nodded to him, not trusting himself to speak again, in case another poor attempt at a joke came out. Although, he reasoned, he really wasn't all that jokey about the witnesses. The vicar got to his feet and the two men crossed over as Jesus went to sit and the vicar took the hot spot before the villagers. Small wine break. I'll check on how you guys think has been worth it, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh, well, that's good to know. Maybe I'm less self-conscious because I know I can't do the accents. I then can't do them because I'm thinking about them. So, right, all right, I'll send Tom out for more wine tomorrow. <laughs> the vicar got to his feet and the two men crossed over as Jesus went to sit and the vicar took the hotspot before the villagers. He asked if they had any questions. They had none. He bade them farewell and said they were all welcome to stay for a bit of a catch-up should they wish to. They all left. Hamish, Sarah, the vicar and Jesus remained in the hall. All the wind swept out of their sails, all the energy in the room soaking back into the aged floorboards where it would join the dust and the dreams of generations of Norton folk past. They sagged into their plastic chairs, eyes and limbs tired, minds racing in slow motion. Hamish was trying to piece together what he'd witnessed, whether he'd imagined the light and shade changing in the room as Jesus had spoken, or if the man truly was a prophet. How could you be faced with proof and still not believe? Jesus was trying to remember what he'd said. He felt like it had been a pretty good speech, given how long he'd been out of the game. He tried to keep it to a tight seven minutes, and the only real clangor had probably been the carbohydrates. He had no idea where that had come from. Sarah was trying to keep her body under control. Her stomach was churning, arching one minute and spasming back down into cramps the next, leaving her terrified she would vomit or worse, right here where she sat if she didn't fully concentrate. Had the rest of the village known it was her who caused this nightmare? What would they do if they found out? What was Jesus going to do? What was he expecting from her? What would Hamish do? The vicar felt empty, totally empty. He couldn't take his eyes off Jesus. He was distraught and baffled. How could this be happening? How could he be in the presence of the greatest love his life had ever known and feel uncomfortable, rejected and wrong? How could he not like Jesus? And was it possible that Jesus did not like him? The four of them sat in the afternoon sun, the air still and aged. Hamish's hand found Sarah's and they hung together, still and confidently, if only physically, connected. Would you like a hand putting the chairs away? Offered Jesus. There we go, that's the end of that chapter. I like that chapter, I think. Um, I'm, yeah, quite, every now and again there's a chapter that I think, oh. That doesn't mean I wrote that. <laughs> oh, what a drunken old sot I am. Anyway, um, thanks for joining me. Sorry I was a bit of an emotional tears at the beginning. Um, that's just to have a roadmap for this whole um, losing everything and everybody being worried and sad. But um, that was fun. This this cheered me up. Uh, I think I can do the same time tomorrow. If not tomorrow, I'm doing something called Board Game Smackdown. Um, which will be at seven o'clock. I'll tweet it. Um, if anybody comes to this that isn't on Twitter and would prefer notifications another way, let me know and I'll put it on all my social medias. I'm trying not to be too much of a social media pleb. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm doing this thing called Board Game Smackdown, which is where a load of comedians play board games on a live stream. So that'll be really fun tomorrow. So hopefully I can still do this at eight. If not, I will sort the timing out tomorrow um, and we'll find another time to do it. Uh, but thank you all for coming. I like you all a lot. Hello, Laura and Scollard or S. Collard. I imagine it's S. Collard. I don't know. Well, hello to you and hello, Claire and Kevin and Faye and, and all of you, Jay. Hello. Um, thank you so much and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.